Welcome back to Home Gym History. My name is Rob, and I'm here with Jake and Adam, and we are going to be diving into the history of the curling bar. If this is your first time listening, I'll be giving a quick history of things, and then I'll be bouncing that history off of these modern experts, Adam and Jake, to see if they can make any comparisons or give some opinions on this item. Now, Jake, Adam, in addition to the curl bar, I'm sure you've seen plenty of specialty bars. But in my opinion, when it comes to a specialty bar, I think it's one of the most common. I think it's like the go-to, even if you're picking up some used weights, you might just get one included with it. Can you think of any other specialty bars that are as common as the curl bar? Maybe a, like a, um, uh, a hex deadlift bar. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Safety squat bars are, are, are gaining notoriety, but not quite there yet. Yeah, even when I think about going to a commercial gym, you're likely mm -hmm. only going to find a straight bar and then curl bars. I don't know if I've ever seen, like if you go to an LA Fitness, for example, I don't think there's anything other than those two types of bars there. I didn't think of that, but that's a great point, Jake, about the commercial gyms that, yeah, I don't know if I've ever, you know, unless it was some type of powerlifting gym or some type of, you know, you know, really cool old school gym. I, I don't think I've walked into a, uh, you know, Planet Fitness and seen a, <laughs> yeah. a uh, Kabuki trap bar sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> that would get the lunk alarm. <laughs> but in any case, back on track. So when it comes to the easy curl bar, as it's became known, a lot of the history was kind of stepped over, forgotten, misstated, up until a gentleman named Paul Quinn, who I had just the blessing, the fortune to speak with recently, did a ton of research. So right on the top of the episode here, I want to take a second and just thank him for his time, his efforts. Like less than 2% of the research for this episode came from me. Just the basics. 98% or more came from Paul Quinn and his just extraordinary effort to figure out the true history of the curl bar. And I'll be dropping some little details throughout the episode as far as how far he went and the literal long drives and lengths to which he went to figure this out. So thank you, Paul Quinn. Getting into it, it was not invented by York Barbell. I just want to put that out right away. A lot of people credit York Barbell with the invention of the curl bar, and that's just not the case. Prior to that, a man named Louis Dimick came up with it. Dimick, possibly. And he grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. He was an engineer and later a physical therapist. And when it comes to the curl bar, much like, you know, other specialty bars or other innovations in the home gym space, it was a problem that inspired it. Jake, Adam, can you think off the top of your head or have you ever heard of what caused this gentleman to invent the curl bar? Probably some wrist mobility and some some pain in gripping and curling a straight bar yeah it uh what he experienced was that if he bent the curl bar and if you don't know out there no shame in that game the curl bar instead of being straight is bent in several places four different places it has four bends so that there are a couple different grips you can take one main grip is towards the outside and the curved profile of the bar basically allowed the user's wrists and forearms to take a more neutral, less supinated position. And that neutral, less supinated position led to a more comfortable grip and led to being able to lift more, if you will. So he came out with the Demic Curling Bar and he filed for a patent in 1948. These are the original patent papers, or at least an image of them. I don't actually possess them. And in the patent papers, you can see the bends that were achieved. The cool thing I think is that he was doing this as a one man job in his garage. He had a torch. He'd heat up the steel bar and then he would bend it by hand around a jig that he made. So this 48 inch, you know, one and one sixteenth diameter bar was being bent by this man. And if you look at the image of Lewis at the age of 73, you can see this is a fit guy. So he was quite an impressive innovator. Then he'd actually package them up in his kitchen. And his son, Dennis, remembers seeing his father in the kitchen packaging up 
these bars to sell. And he'd run advertisements like this one that would claim, do your arms measure 17 inches? And then lay out all the details of his invention, the curling bar, the diamond curling bar. Well, that's where the story takes a turn. Lewis gets a job in Arizona, and he decides to take that job in Arizona because his son is having problems with asthma. The dry air will help, so they move out to Arizona. And that makes things a little tricky in terms of, you know, trying to continue marketing this bar and trying to continue selling this bar. So Andy Jackson of the Jackson Barbell Company he makes an agreement with Lewis to sell the bar as the Dymock Jackson Curling Bar. And in 1951, after Dymock heads out to Hughes Aircraft in Tucson, this agreement is made. And Jackson basically provides easier production, sales, advertising. So that's one of the modern things I wanted to ask both of you. Can you think of a smaller company that struck a deal with a larger company because, you know, they didn't quite want to keep operating the way they were, you know, was absorbed by a bigger company. Well, I think the most recent example would be Go Strong oh, yeah. being absorbed by Rogue. And right away, you kind of see Rogue start producing their products mm -hmm. and even with the same brand and help distribute them, them in an easier way, you know? Yeah. And I mean, the owner of Go Strong, if you've never read it, listeners out there, I'm sure you can still see it on the website. He wrote a... a very personal, very straightforward message about why he was making the decisions he was making and, um, you know, his life and the changes in his life. So, you know, I think there's a definite connection there, you know, changes in Lewis Dimmick's life, you know, causing him to want to partner with Jackson. So that's a great example, a great connection, Jake. Any others you can think of? Well, no problem. Don't worry. I have more questions for you, boys. So... <laughs> It started getting marketed then a little wider. And as the Dimmick Jackson curling bar was, you know, a bit of a name. And for a couple of years there, from 1952 to 1954, advertisements appear in Iron Man for this. Now, there makes a shift at that point in 1954 to being called the Jackson curling bar. So things aren't going too well. And, you know, they're not selling that much, but they're selling enough. That Lewis, you know, is seemingly, and as far as, you know, the source of this Paul Quinn could tell, is, you know, making a little, you know, payment from Jackson. But it's nothing that, you know, is going to send him into early retirement. And things are going well with his day job, and he's working as an engineer. So he contacts Jackson in 1954, and he tells him, look, you can just have it. Like, you know, it could just be the Jackson bar. And he seemingly for free, just gives the rights to the curl bar. This, as you mentioned, the most common specialty bar, in our opinion, was just given. Here you go. So that's my next question. Have you ever heard of that, that someone just gave away the rights to their innovation, just said, you know what, you can have it? Not in today's world. <laughs> no. I've heard of the opposite plenty of times where people said, whoa, I invented that. And that's the next twist in our story. So before we get to that, though, I want to show you that, listeners, if you are stuck around this long, you are in for a treat. So thank you for listening. This is the treat. These are arguably, I think, some of the rarest weight plates ever produced. So Jackson made the 1A Olympic set, and he made about 500 of them. And all of the 1A Olympic sets were, you know, calibrated to within an ounce they were that you know accurate and when i say calibrated i don't mean like today's calibration and calibrated plates that are produced i mean like andy jackson worked on them and was just really good at what he did so of those jackson 1a plates they're rare to begin with you know there's 500 sets of them well then there's one set that exists that say to lewis from andy as a gift Andy Jackson had 45s, 1A Olympic 45s, that I'll put an image up of now, made that look identical to other 1As, except for in the casting. It wasn't written on there. This is in the actual metal. In the casting, it says, to Lewis from Andy. And he gifted them to Lewis. As a big thank you for the curling bar. This was a surprise. 
So as Lewis's son told Paul Quinn, it was just a normal day at the house. They were renting part of a duplex. They had a carport and a shed, and these crates just arrived. And this is back in 1954. This is day and age before there were Amazon vans stopping by every three seconds to throw a new box on your doorstep. So this was big news, you know. It, it immediately made me think of the scene in uh, A Christmas Story, you know, when the crate arrives and they're like, it's a major award. <laughs> Only it sounds like it wasn't that reaction, you know. It sounds like it was like, what are we, what are we gonna do with this? Because, like I said, they have a carport and they have a shed, and they really didn't have like a basement for a basement gym. This is Arizona, so they end up sticking them in the shed, and <laughs> that's where they resided for some time until the plates were sold to Johnny Gibson, who was Mister Tucson in the fifties and Mister Arizona. He had a gym. And that's where they resided until a previous owner that we'll get to a little later hung on to them and eventually Paul Quinn bought them. So that's a little nugget of history that is pretty cool with this uh, curling bar story are these one-off plates. Gentlemen, do you know of any modern one-off, like one-of-a-kind home gym pieces that exist? Uh, this one's kind of ridiculous, but it's the... Uh... How about the 24 karat gold Massonomics drink spot? Ooh, that is one of a kind. <laughs> yes, sir. I've got my bubbly sitting in my drink spotter right now. Shout out to the boys out there in Massonomics land. How about you, Jake? I can't think of anything else that's a one off. What about, I mean, what about some of the plates created for something like the Arnold? There you go. Arnold competitions. Yeah, there's this guy with a mustache that does gym reviews. I don't know if you've seen him. But he had, uh, long before the Rogue Deep Dish, I'm referring to Coop, by the way, of Garage Gym Reviews. Hi, Coop. And he had, uh, and probably still has, for, as far as I know, the deep dish that Rogue had made. And I think they were from the Arnold. And then somehow, he tells it in a video. I haven't seen the video in a while, but he tells how he, he, he got a hold of them, a pair of these. And so way before Rogue started putting out deep dish, Coop had some rogue deep dish. So those, definitely one of a kind. I mean, I don't know what happened to the others. That's a good point, though. Competitions have probably produced some one of a kind. You know, even if it's just the normal barbell, the fact that it was used in the Olympics or used in the Arnold or in whatever, the World Games, whatever competition it was. CrossFit Games has their bumpers with the, uh, the year on them. You know, someday some joker will have a whole bunch of CrossFit games bumpers <laughs> hanging up behind him like I have these deep dish hanging up behind me. Yeah. So these plates are now being cared for by, I would think, the best owner for them. Because Paul Quinn, he actually contacted the family, you know, descendants, the, uh, the son, the daughter, the wife of Lewis, because Lewis had passed away by the time Paul had gotten the plates. And he went and met up with them and took one of the plates so that they could see them. And I mean, talk about nostalgia and like remembering your childhood. It's like, whoa, I remember when these got dropped off at the end of the driveway. <laughs> like what a cool thing. So that's what I mean by the deep research here. He got in his car and drove to like bring some of this history to life for the family of this man. So again, big thanks to Paul Quinn. So now back on track with the story. So it's a nice thank you, but then eh, he doesn't really end up using them much. So eventually he sells them to Johnny Gibson. And eventually Jackson, he hears that, wait a minute, what? York? Out there in York, PA? Because Jackson was in New Jersey. He's like, in York, they're making curl bars? Like, I have the patent on that. Like, it, it was given to me by Lewis, the inventor. So he gets word through the grapevine because, you know, just like today, it's sort of a small community. And even though there's no, you know internet back then he gets word that there's some designs and that bob hoffman over there at york is going into production so he sends a very pointed letter and as he put it in his own words because paul quinn was able to get a letter that he wrote that andy jackson wrote in 1985 telling the story he said i brought bob hoffman to task and meaning like i told bob hoffman hey you either pay me for the rights to the curling bar or I'm going to, you know, send you a cease and desist letter. Well, at that point, Bob Hoffman sends two of his guys, John Turpeck, who was eventually vice president of York. He's a you know, famous strongman lifter. And John Grimmick, one of the most famous. He sends two of his top guys out to New Jersey to give, you know, Andy Jackson payment and buy on June 12th, 1964, the rights. So how much do you think Bob Hoffman paid for the rights 
to the curling bar. And this wasn't the right to also produce one. This was to then own and be the exclusive producer of the curling bar. And this is 1964. So I know none of us are really economic majors or anything, but what do you think he paid? A couple hundred bucks. Like four hundred dollars. Five thousand. Well Which sounds crazy low, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Jake, you are the winner here. Don't worry, Adam. I have more contests coming up. So Jake, you win. It was two thousand. But you are uh actually no, Adam, you would be closer. Jesus. No, Adam. Yeah, yeah, it shows I'm clearly not a math major. <laughs> so yeah, Adam, you're the winner. Louise, yeah, Adam, two thousand. <laughs> So 2000 bucks, <laughs> but I love this image of like, you know, Bob Hoffman gets this letter, taking him to task. He's like, fine. You know, he probably is like junk, you know, go get Grimmick and Turpac and, you know, send him to New Jersey with some money. And he takes two grand up there and they come back with the paperwork and the actual jig. Because what you had to do, like I said at the beginning of this, was to put the bar in and bend it by hand. And that's what Jackson was still doing. He was bending these curl bars. Well, Hoffman gets it. No one's bending it by hand. I mean, he has York Barbell Company, the largest in the United States at the time. So he develops the machinery and he starts making it, you know, factory made curl bars. He also does something that then influences the rest of the curl bar. He renames it. It's no longer the curling bar. It's the easy curl bar. And he spells it with a K though. So that dropped off, but the name Easy Curl Bar has hung on, whether it's produced by York or not. So then Hoppin renames it Easy Curl Bar. June 12th is when he got the rights, and sure enough, page 58 of the June 1964 Muscular Development, there it is, the apparatus of the month, the Easy Curl Bar. He wasted no time in getting it out there. Sales are much better than with Jackson. Maybe it was the name, maybe it was the distribution, the magazine. You could argue any of those points. But either way, the curl bar takes off. 1968, the patent rights expire, and this is the big explosion. Now anyone can make a curl bar. So when it comes down to it, you know, that was the real proliferation, if you will, of the curl bar. So now, what became of all this? What kind of curl bars do you see, see these days? I mean, I can remember even when I was a kid having a curl bar and even as a young man, buying some used weights and having a curl bar thrown in there. I didn't even want it, but it was just part of it. What do you guys have? I see Adam. You have one right behind you there. Yeah, the rackable curl bar behind me, and then I have the shortened easy curl bar right here. Now, one big difference I see, both of those have knurling. So the mm -hmm. original York curl bars and the original Jackson and Dimmick Jackson curl bars did not mm -hmm. have knurling. So here's an original York. And then 1964 to 1968, they had an inner collar, collar fixed. This one is after 1968 because at that point, York started just putting the uh, set screw collars on here, the silver ones. And then eventually, kind of like yours, Adam, York had the split sleeve Olympic curl bar that came out. Same thing, bare, no knurling. But that's how you can tell if you're buying an old curl bar that it's quite old. There's no knurling. And then eventually they put knurling on both. The rackable, though, that's an innovation. You know, that's a fairly recent thing that, hey, we'll make this a little longer. Whose is yours by? Where did you buy it? That's the Titan one Titan. behind me. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to our last episode debating made in U.S. <laughs> versus overseas. You know, you got a little of that debate <laughs> going on. And then... As far as any other innovations, can you think of anything else? Well, Gungnir just added their their uh, built-in collars. That's true. The, to take it to the next level. Gungnir, yeah. I, call, I constantly mispronounce it. Call them Gungan. That's the Jar Jar Binks uh, species in Star Wars. So I imagine, I imagine they're big Jar Jar Binks fans over there. <laughs> their Norwegian company. Yeah, so... the. So that, and then just the fact that there's bushings mm -hmm. in there is unique. I w I'm guessing the first ones didn't have those. Uh, not that I can tell, no. So I would agree with you. That's an innovation. There's some different shapes and things uh, that I've seen. There's also just generic ones that are the super easy curl bar, you know, like these, that have the, mm -hmm. you know, extreme bend to them, almost like a U shape. And then you can do tricep extensions or hammer curls. 
So there's a variety. Now, whatever happened to Lewis? Well, after the sale, he continued his career as an engineer. And um, he also continued his passion and his hobby with uh, strength sports and things of that nature. So he had several different innovations and things that were still part of you know, the, the world of fitness. In 1975, he had a Dimmick negative curl exercise that Weeder bought off of him. He patented, uh, 1976, an Easy Boy machine, which at first I got excited. I was like, oh my gosh, he also invented that reclining chair. And no, he didn't. It's not the, uh, whatever that one is, the Easy Boy reclining. Lazy Boy. Lazy Boy, yeah. He didn't invent that. It's, it's something else. And in 1978, there's also Paul Quinn found a letter from Joe Weeder directly to Dimmick asking about a product of his or an invention of his called the Power Star, which it's unclear what that was. But just the fact that, you know, we're talking about like the two, one of the two leaders, global leaders by that time, most would argue in, you know, gym equipment and fitness, Joe Weeder directly writing a letter to this man to ask about something shows how involved he still was more than a decade and a half later in this industry. That'd be like if Bill Henninger, someone who owned a leading company, just started contacting one of us to ask about one of our brainchilds. So Lewis passed away in 2011. And then as far as credit for the curl bar, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people involved here. Demick invented it. Jackson continued it to a bigger audience and, you know, continued working with it. It could have gone by the wayside. We might not even have a curl bar if Jackson hadn't picked it up and Lewis stopped making it. But then Hoffman arguably popularized it. He gave it its current generic name, if you will, Easy Curl Bar, and he brought it to an even bigger audience. So where do you weigh in on that, guys? Who gets the lion's share of the credit for the curl bar? I think the lion's share goes to the, uh, the man who had the original patent. So it goes to Lewis. What do you think, Jake? That's what I would say, too. Yeah, I'd go with that. Well, you see, that's why I enjoy talking with you guys, because I agree as well. So we're three for three with giving full credit to Lewis. And I would wager to say, I don't want to speak for him, but Paul Quinn, uh, the man who researched the bulk of this, I would say would agree as well. So he'll probably be happy to hear that. Now, for the collectors out there or people that are curious or scouring the open market, how do you tell the difference between some of this stuff? Like I just mentioned a little tidbit about York that they were inner fixed collars up until 1968 and then they went to the set screw collars. But how do you tell if you find like a, a Dimmick bar or a Jackson bar? Well, there's a couple different ways. So Jake, Adam, any thoughts on how you might identify one of these original ones? We well, shared uh, not having, um, any knurling. There you go. And then I'm wondering if the, um, you can tell if it was bent in the rig. Mm-hmm. And if it was that using machine, if there's some kind of marking that you'd be able to tell. What do you think, Jake? That's that's what I was that's what I was gonna say. Something along the lines of like how they were created. I imagine if mm-hmm. you're just bending them kind of relatively manual, it'd be mm-hmm. almost like a, a straighter. It wouldn't be like circular, it'd be more just like a straight bend. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm just guessing. Well, listeners, I, I pledge to you on my scouts honor i did not share my notes with adam and jake prior to this but they are dead on like (laughs) you gentlemen are quite intelligent on this front you know i i shared some ideas of where we were going with this but i gave i didn't give these details so you know maybe i'm making vintage weights collectors after you gentlemen after all you know i'm bringing you over to the vintage side of things so you're dead on let's start with the manufacturing process so in order to really set it up in the jig, which was, imagine just um, a flat plane that then had different posts on it, and then you would take and put the bar in so that you could start bending. They had to score, and by they, I shouldn't say they, Lewis. Lewis had to score the middle of the bar. So Dimmick bars will have a light scratch, if you will, line in the middle of the bar so they could see where to place it. But that doesn't really sound, you know, now I've got anyone with a curl bar scratching the middle of it and claiming it's an original curl, it's a curl bar. But it's one of many clues. So that's one of the clues. Second clue would be that, as far as we know, there weren't inner collars on them. They were just a bar. You'd have to buy the collars. But there's some murkiness there because Paul Quinn had found 
a prototype of the curl bar, the Demi curl bar that did have inner collars. So that one's a little murky too. But then you two touched on the biggest factor for at least identifying a Demi Jackson curl bar versus a York curl bar. And I've come across a lot of York curl bars, uh, standard curl bars, probably more than 10, and they are identical. Whereas looking at pictures that Paul Quinn provided that I'll put up an image, the Jackson and the Demick curl bars are not the same bends, especially the outer bend. It's a sharper bend. And to the best of Paul Quinn's knowledge, when I was speaking with him, I asked, you know, what's what's the best identifying feature? He said that, you know, when York took it to the machinery and took it to a factory made, it just was more of a smoother bend. It wasn't that sharp bend at the end. And he put his little personal bit in there, and I don't think he minds me sharing, that he thinks the original ones are more comfortable now. You know, maybe some of that is just his love for the, the topic at hand, but I really want to find one. I want to try one. So that's one of the biggest indicators. There are about 200 Jackson curling bars that Andy Jackson labeled Jackson on the actual bar. He punched in the letters Jackson. And it's unknown why in that period of, you know, the early 50s, 1952 to 1954, when he was making the Dimmick Jackson, and then 1954 up until 1964 when he was making the Jackson curling board, why he only some of them he put his name in, but they do exist. So, you know, if you ever see a standard curling bar like this one for one inch plates that says Jackson on it, that's pretty clear. Other than that, it would be the curves. So when you're looking at them, this one out here comes down, I should hold it this way, comes down at a sharper angle. Now, I don't know of anyone uh, personally, that has found one. I know they do exist, and I know of a couple different collectors that have them, but I just mean in, like, recent time, in the last, whatever, year to two years, I don't remember anyone posting, like, wow, look, I I, I found this Dimmick Jackson or this Jackson, you know, uh, original curling bar, but I know they're out there, especially the Jackson ones, because the Jackson ones have collars that say Jackson on them as well, so they're a little easier, but the Dimmick Jackson ones, that would be the ones that, those would be the ones I'm kind of curious about. So for collectors out there, the last thing I'd say is that the York bar is 46 inches, whereas the older ones, the Demick Jackson and Jackson ones are 48 inches. Moving forward, gentlemen, we all agree he needs credit for this. Do you know of a modern you know, inventor that may not have gotten the credit that they deserve? That'll be my last question to wrap this up, because thanks to Paul Quinn, Lewis is now getting the credit not just from me, but from Paul getting the credit he deserves for inventing this mainstay of commercial and home gyms. Anyone out there not getting enough credit we need to shout out? We could go the Donnie Thompson route, right? There you go. Nice. I mean, Donnie Thompson, jeez. Yeah, off the top of my head, there's the bow tie, the fat bells, the fat pad. Jeez, he has a lot of stuff that he's come up with. Better mass dumbbells. Yeah, yeah, the fat bells. So that's a good one. Fat a pillar, Mr. Donnie Thompson. That's what he switched his name to on Instagram, the fat a pillar. <laughs> you gotta love that. That's his second appearance on this podcast. So we'll see in the upcoming episode if we can make it three because stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you follow. We're going to jump into the world of dumbbells on our next episode and Donnie will make a third appearance. This is Rob. You can find me at VintageWeightsPGH.com. It's also VintageWeightsPGH on Instagram and YouTube. And, of course, this is brought to you by Garage Gym Radio. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube to Garage Gym Radio so you don't miss an episode of Home Gym History. Catch us on Spotify and iTunes. If you really love us, give us five stars. Those are all the plugs. Jake and Adam, do you have anything for the listeners? Thank you, Paul. All right. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you to Paul Quinn. Really appreciate all your hard work. All right, folks. See you next time.